Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I invite you to allow those words to be your entryway into this time of prayer and meditation. In this time of quietness and introspection. This time of opening ourselves to the divine presence of God within us and all around us. In this time of connection, wherein we are all linked together in heart and in mind to create this dynamic energy that is generated when we come together under the banner of the living spirit of God. So today, no matter where you are in your life, I invite you to consider God's grace and God's presence in everything that is taking place in your life. And I invite you to create a vision in your heart of how you would like to transform your experiences into greater good and greater opportunities and greater possibilities. So as we begin, I invite you to take a deep, refreshing breath. So just sit back in your seat and get comfortable. And to literally slow your mind down. Just temporarily set aside all of the busyness in your life. And just rest in God. So one more deep, refreshing breath. And then just be still. So let us draw this time to a close by giving thanks for all the incredible experiences that we are able to enjoy in this journey of life, for all the people who bless us in so many ways and who are blessed by us. To give thanks for our amazing community and for this incredible universe within which we live and move and have our very being. 
We're grateful in the name and through the nature of the living Christ, and so it is. And amen. Morning again, everyone. And um, I welcome to everybody who tunes in online. And a special shout out to Tracy, who watches us in New Jersey. Uh, thanks for the note and the support. Appreciate it a lot, Tracy. Welcome. So how many people here uh, have ever had a dream that you really wanted or had a great opportunity present itself to you, and you allowed fear to stop you from going after it? Anybody ever have that? So many people here ever got a really big idea? Uh, or you had, um, you know, some big vision that got you really, really excited, but it also frightened you, and you ended up deciding to settle for less and play it safe. Anybody ever play it safe? You know, the thing is, everybody wants a more fulfilling life. We want uh, to fulfill our dreams. We want more success and happiness, and yet sometimes we hold ourselves back from going after it. You know, we sometimes don't allow ourselves to take a chance. We don't allow ourselves uh, to try or work for it or move towards the very life we're seeking. Why is it that we play it safe? Why is it that we settle and hold ourselves back from the very good that we are seeking? You know, I think that there are three reasons why we settle, why we hold back, and why we play it safe. And the first is fear. There's a fear that there is nothing more out there, and you better hold on to what you can. Take whatever you can get. You know, there's a fear that not only is take what you get, but not, life might get worse. So you, you better hold on to what you have. Fear is an amazing thing that, that, that stops us, you know, from seeking the very good that we are desiring. The second thing is that sometimes we have a, 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 an idea of our, that we're unworthy and incapable of something greater. That we're not worthy of being pre vice president. We're not worthy of making a six or seven figure income. We're not worthy of um, someone dating us that you know, might be that beautiful or that whatever. And then we think sometimes is, could I really handle that much success? Could I handle that much greatness? Could I handle all the expectations? So we end up settling. And the final one is just uh, old fashioned impatience and laziness. Because sometimes, most of us, we want it fast and we would like it easy, don't we? Really. We like it not. But the truth is, most things take time and they take work. And sometimes it's like, ah, oh, that's too hard, I'll just take this, thanks. It is amazing how often we give in. It is amazing how often we settle and how we play it safe. Kind of reminds me of this old guy that was playing golf. And he hit his ball into the sh shallow pond, and as he's going to retrieve the ball, uh, there's a frog there, and to his amazement, the frog talks to him, and the frog says, kiss me, and I will turn into a beautiful princess, and I will be all yours for a week. And the old guy looked around, and he picked up the frog, and he put it in his pocket, and he kept playing golf. A couple of minutes later, the frog says, okay, kiss me, and I will change into a beautiful princess, and I will be all yours for a whole month. Man ignored and just the offer and kept playing golf. And then finally, the, about a minute later, the frog spoke out and said, all right, kiss me and I will turn into a beautiful princess and I'll be yours for a whole year. Finally, the man opened his pocket, looked at the frog and said, ah, no thanks. At my age, I'd rather have a talking frog. <laughs> okay. Clearly, I settled um, on the quality of joke. No. <laughs> I don't want no talking frog. Come on. So over the last several weeks, we've been, uh, last two or three weeks, we've been talking about change, how to do with change. Every one of us goes through change. You know, change is a, a part of life. And we've been using the analogy of how to handle change with that um, line, uh, when one door closes, uh, another door uh, opens. And we've been looking at uh, Reverend Ellen Devonport's book, Hell in the Hallway, Light at the Door, to give us some ideas. You know, the fact is, doors that close in our lives represent endings, and we don't like endings. Endings are not easy for us. Whether a relationship ends by divorce or an argument, it's not easy. If a job ends by getting fired or downsized, it's not easy. Sometimes a way of life ends for us, that maybe we move out of a neighborhood or a city that we've been in for a long time. Maybe you know, it's a serious diagnosis. Maybe um, it's an accident or an injury or bankruptcy or the death of a loved one. But life as we have known it you know, changes so much that it was so much a part of our life, we kind of don't know who we are without it. 
They were uncertain and unsure about what to do, and that hallway can be a dark place. It is a place from the door that is closed, but the door that hasn't quite opened yet. From the place between what was to what will be, to what used to be to what's going to be, and it can be a lonely place of uncertainty. It can feel very uncomfortable, and as uncomfortable a place it is, I think the hallway is an important place. Because while it is a place of pain, it is also a place of potential. While it is a place of hurting, it is a place also of healing. While it's a place of transition, it is a place also of transformation. And that new beginning, however, whatever that would be, all depends on how well we handle endings and how well we handle the hallways. In the first week, I asked how many people like doors that close. Everybody put up their hand. I said, how many people like doors that open? Everybody put up their hand. Everybody was excited about doors that open. But I would suggest to you that sometimes open doors and new beginnings can be just as scary as doors that close and things that end. Sometimes a new beginning can scare us in thinking, oh, can I handle all that responsibility, all that, all the pressure and all the demands? Sometimes stepping into a new relationship can scare us to say, Do I, am I really willing to open my heart and be more vulnerable and p- potentially get hurt? Sometimes the new beginning can stretch us and call us in ways that, that we're not quite ready to open yet or not sure if we're prepared. So open doors represent new beginnings and new opportunities, but sometimes new opportunities can, 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 terrify, uh, can terrify us. So the question is, how do we move through the hallway to be able to open that new door and to walk through it in the most healthy and positive way possible? So I'll do a little quick review. Week one, we talked about doors that close, and there were three things about it. Number one is to understand that change is a part of life. You can't have progress or improvement. Life cannot improve or get better in any way without change. And so it's important to accept that change happens. Second is you've got to embrace your humanity. Sometimes we think it's not spiritual to be sad or angry or frustrated. But the fact is Jesus wept. He got angry, and he felt overwhelmed. You know, sometimes we try to avoid feelings. Anybody, you've all heard uh, we're spiritual beings having a human experience, but with the way we try to avoid all the negative parts, it's almost like we're spiritual beings trying to avoid a human experience. And the truth is, if you want to have an embrace a full and fabulous life, you've got to embrace all the feelings and experiences that go with it. You can't push and deny some away and try and only focus on others. You have to actually embrace all of it. And finally, is to understand you're not a victim. This didn't happen to you. It happens for you that these experiences are to help us grow and to evolve. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Last week we talked about the work in the hallway. This is the tough part. And the first thing is to do is to surrender and let go. Sometimes we hold on to so much resistance. And sometimes, you know, when we fall apart and get brought to our knees, sometimes we need to almost have our hearts broken and open so we can just let go. Because the more we can let go and trust that God has a plan for us, the more we open ourselves to greater possibilities. We also need to, you know, forgive ourselves and forgive others that we think that might have closed that door. And then um, finally, we also need to be able to just be patient. It is a process change. It is a process of transformation. You can't rush through it. And so today we're going to talk about the open door, opening that door. You know, the book of Revelations, it says this, look. I have set before you an open door that no one will be able to shut. And in Matthew it says, knock and the door will be opened unto you. You know, doors represent not only new beginnings, but they represent new opportunities. They represent possibilities. They represent more good that they represent an abundance of all things that you at your life, at any stage of your life, there are more open doors. There are more opportunities, more possibilities for your life. There's always an abundance of good available to us. So the question is, how do we move through and step through the hallway into this open door? And the first thing is to understand that with change, it's not just a matter of job ends and I got a new job. Or relationship ends and I got the new relationship. Or a way of life ends and I started a new life. That it, That is not what um, change is all about. It is actually about Letting go of an old consciousness and accepting a new consciousness. It is letting go an old way of being and seeing and and living life and raising up to a higher level of awareness and consciousness. Awakening at a spiritual level and raising our vibrational level. 
You know, when it says in scriptures, look, the old has passed away, everything has become new. It is really talking about inside. The old ideas, the old way we've saw, seen ourselves has passed away. And look, there's a new way, a new perspective, a new consciousness that has come forth. You know, Paul said, don't conform to this patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, Paul also said, let the same mind that was in Christ Jesus be in you. So how do we shift our consciousness and raise our consciousness? And that is by turning to God in prayer. By taking time to center ourselves in spirit and to immerse our mind in the mind of God with regular, quiet time. You think it's a coincidence that Jesus prayed in the morning, in the middle of the day, in the afternoon, in the evening, and at night? It's Jesus. You think he need to pray that much? And the answer is yes. Because we all, to, to have a consciousness of God, you always have to keep recentering, realigning, and immersing our minds in the mind of God. Pramahansa Yogananda said, you know, having a job's important. Family's important. Friends are important. Money's important. There are a lot of things in life that's important. But by far, the most important thing in our life is to seek our oneness with God. And to seek our oneness with God and turn to God in all things. He said the most important work for us in our lives is to be seeking, centering, immersing, and our lining our hearts and minds in the mind of God. And no matter what the issue is, always keep turning back to God. You have a new goal or dream you want? First, center yourself in God. You have some problems going on in your relationship? First, center your heart in God. You have a legal issue going on. Turn and center yourself in God. That the more you turn to God in all things, the more all, all things will flow with God's spirit. Jesus said, when you pray, you should go into your inner chamber and close the door and speak to your Father, Heavenly Father who is in secret, and your Father who is in secret shall reward you. So what he's saying is the most important thing you do for your whole life is to turn within, to go within and go to that secret place that no one else can go but you and you will be rewarded. Good things will happen. One of my favorite parables that illustrates the point I want to make here now is called the parable of the, of the seed growing secretly. How many people have heard of the parable of the seed growing secretly? Nobody, so apparently it's quite a secret. It's quite a secret. <laughs> So I'd like to share that secret parable with you right now. <laughs> a man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, and he does not know how. And the point I'm trying to make is, is that when you pray, pray to God, when you turn and go to that secret place, Good things happen, and you don't know how. When I pray and I feel confused and lost, I will pray, and a couple hours later, I'll be like, wow, I am feeling good, and I don't know how. You ever prayed for some guidance in your life, and it came, and you don't know how? All you need to do is go to that secret, quiet place and give your heart to God, and I guarantee you, you will be rewarded It'll sprout and grow, and you won't know how. In the same way that we don't know exactly what happens in a cocoon, we don't know what happens in a womb. Remember when Paul got blinded for those three days? We don't know what, in the tomb, we don't know what happened in there. Sapa, something happened. And we don't need to know how, but in every case, something great was birthed. Something great came forth from that quiet place from that place of solitude and solace. And my question for you is, would you be willing to take time every day to seek and turn to God in all things and go to that quiet place and let yourself be rewarded? Let something new be birthed. Let the guidance from you come forth and to turn to God in every single thing you need. Because the most powerful thing we can do in our lives is to seek the wholeness and the source that makes all possible because it will shift our consciousness which will begin to change our lives. First thing is to shift your consciousness by turning and centering to God in prayer daily. Second thing is to bring forth a level of clarity and creativity by activating your desire. 
You know, Ellen says something really I, I love. She says, in every situation, choose powerful over pitiful. No matter what's going on, instead of moaning, whining, and disliking, instead of choosing pitiful, choose powerful. You know why? Why? Because God has given us all the power to choose. Choose whom you will serve this day. It also says in Scripture, decide upon a thing, and it will be established for you. And the greatest tools of choosing and deciding and to move our lives forward is the ability and the practice of getting clear about what we desire. Desire is what takes us from a desire for a better love, a desire for more love, a desire for more success, is the thing that what moves our lives forward. Desire you know, drives us, but it brings us clarity and it also opens the, the channels of creativity. I love desire because it focuses, it awakens, it engages, and it channels our spiritual creative energies. So the question is, what do you want? You know, I think most of us know clearly what we don't want. So what do you want? I don't know. But what do you want? I don't know. And the fact is, the most valuable time we could use is to take time to get clear on what it is we desire, what it is that we want. So a simple question. What do you want and what's your highest desire for your relationship? Or relationships? What is your highest desire? for your health? What is your highest desire for your career? Your highest desire for your finances? Desires activate and begin to engage and let the universal forces begin to move. It's a powerful thing. And the other thing she says is not just your desire of the thing that you want, but also we should set our intention and get our desire clear of how we want to feel. There are all kinds of things we could feel. She says you should write down four things, besides your four goals in those areas, write down four feelings you want to feel. So what would you like to feel every day? Happy, enthusiastic, positive, playful, calm, relaxed, attractive, uh, sexy, confident, grateful. There are all kinds of things you can feel. The question is, what is your intention to feel every day? What would be a great way for you to wake up and feel and for you to feel throughout your day, in your relationship, in your work, in your life? It's all available, but you got to get clear with your intention and clear with your desire. It's a lot easier than we think. She said she knew a lady and all she wrote down was she wanted a job, she went part-time, close to my house, serving people, surrounded by friendly people, and maybe the opportunity to hang outside. A week later, she got a job at this addiction recovery center that was three miles from her house, that was in service to people, that was, uh, had friendly people to work with, and uh, she got to work outdoors. She got everything she wanted. It is amazing. Really, really amazing. I have no idea what that is. The emergency broadcast system? Okay. Okay. I'm going to let my staff handle that. And I'm going to continue on. And one of the important things about desire, about the, 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 the door, is to make sure you're knocking and opening the right door. Sometimes we choose doors that our family thinks we should choose, or culture, of, you know, th- thinks we should do, or what our expectations are. And we aren't always true to ourselves in the exact door that, that, that we're focusing on. My nephew Andrew was visiting here, and um, he's got a master's degree in biomechanics, a very smart, uh, incredible kid. And uh, he went on this trip to Southeast Asia to teach English in, um, you know, one of Southeast Asian countries uh, for six months. And after he traveled around, he went to this Buddhist monastery and he asked if he could stay there and he prayed and he had this kind of spiritual awakening and he came back you know loving and wanting to grow organic vegetables now his dad is a very very successful international engineer and his mom my sister uh, has her PhD and and is a professor and uh, he wants to grow vegetables and so um, (laughs) the thing I love about the kid I love how he loves this he came to visit me. We're in the produce section, the organic. He is touching zucchini. It's like he is touching gold. I'm thinking, it's a zucchini, man. And, but, and I love how much he loves it, and I love that he's being true to himself. He's struggling a bit with money right now. 
and he'd rather do little odd jobs to give him the freedom to keep working at the co-op that he's volunteering at and being in that environment of what he wants rather than going and finding a higher paying and a more status job. And I love that he's being true to himself. So my question is, are you being true to yourself and your goals? Are there any ways that you're allowing other people to pressure you in not doing and following what is yours to do and what your soul is calling you to do? Desire can give you anything you want, but the question is, what does your soul want? What is the deeper part of you seeking in your life? And that's why the hallway is so good, because it forces you to go deep. Not just superficially fill it with something else, but what's your soul really yearning for? And are you willing to go deeper and ask yourself that question? Shift your consciousness in prayer. You know, bring clarity and creativity by getting clear about your desire. And then the final one is to take action. I don't know about you, have you ever been the kind of person um, that wants to make sure all your ducks in a row and everything's all set before you do anything? Anybody ever been like that? It's like, hey, wait, can't, can't start yet because everything's not in order. All the ducks aren't in a row. <laughs> It's amazing. You know, the, 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 the three things that kill anything from happening in our lives, number one, we don't know what we want. Two, we don't think uh, we can do it. And the third one is we don't do anything. We don't do anything. You know, yet scripture says faith without works is dead. And as Nike likes to say, just do it. Do something. Do anything. The thing I love about, um, about the whole idea, just do it, and do it because uh, taking action is important because it gets energy moving. It gets things going. You know, it, it's amazing. It, and, and you know, uh, Thomas J. Watson, who was the CEO and president of uh, IBM, once said, if you want your success rate to increase, double your failure rate. He said, don't wait for everything to be perfect. He said, failing is a good thing because you're doing something and you will learn something. Whatever your goal is, take a step towards it. Even if you fail, it's okay, because it'll teach you, it'll learn, you'll learn something and you'll move in a new direction. You know, try something new, take a step towards your action, ask for help, or help somebody else. One of the great things, if you want to build your dream, help somebody build their dream. You want to make your life better, make, help make someone's life better, guarantee you, your life will get better even quicker. This ministry, last time we did our building thing, we made sure we were building our dream, we helped a family build their dream by building a Habitat for Humanity project. We're gonna do the same thing again. Take some action, move things forward in your life. And sometimes, take an action, even in difficult situations, can bring forth something good. 1991, Connor Clapton, four years old, fell out of a building 53 stories high to his death. I'm sure you guys have heard the story and his father, Eric Clapton, was just devastated. He was in the hallway in a big, big, dark way. He took some time away from music and he and um, Will and Jennings were actually writing the sound um, track for a movie called Rush. And when he came back to work, he said to Will and he said, I wanna write a song about my boy. And his intention was to help himself heal. And through that experience and the desire to take action, he wrote the song, Tears in Heaven, which he said was so healing for him and healing for the world. Hallways aren't easy, but when we're willing to go deep, set our intention and put things into action, spirit will lead us and guide us to even greater things than we have imagined. Muhammad Ali, uh, passed away two, uh, two days ago. And um, just thought I'd mention it. You know, I got to meet Muhammad Ali six or seven years ago. There was a guy that uh, knew somebody that worked for him that set it up. I haven't seen this guy in a while. And coincidentally, he's sitting right in the front row right now. I can't believe this. He's deaf. Why, man? I don't think I ever told you, but that was one of the greatest gifts and one of the most incredible experiences of my life. So I just want to say thank you for doing that. This is like a shock to me to see you. I love Muhammad Ali for a lot of reasons. I even got to share this with him. It's not about his boxing, but I love how he used his life for good when doors closed on him in a big way. In 67, when he chose to be a conscientious observer, he, shut, he goes banned for three years from making income of the thing he did best, and people hated him. And he was in the hallway. 
And out of that experience, he came out and became the heavyweight champion three times. Then another door closed for him back in 1984 when he was diagnosed with Parkinson's. And no longer this great athlete was able to control his body. And then it slammed again as he was no longer able to speak. The most articulate, dynamic, charismatic person was not able to use his voice. And still with the, in the hallway, he didn't stop serving. He didn't stop being great. He didn't stop putting himself out there. He had a belief that those who are too much, uh, to those who are given much, much is expected. And even in losing those things, he still felt like he had much. And he had a responsibility to get out there and make a difference in the world. And remember the Olympics? Was it in 1996? His hand shaken. He lit one of the most inspiring things. It was absolutely, absolutely incredible. And the thing, my favorite thing about him, um, and I've, I've learned a little more over the last few days, in 1964, he became uh, a Muslim. I remember... Um, and then in 1974, he joined the Sunni Muslims. But I didn't know this. In 2005, he actually uh, followed the path of Sufism, which is the mystical, spiritual aspect, the non-religious aspect um, of Islam. And the thing I loved the most about him was how his commitment to his spiritual life. And because he was so committed to his spiritual life, even with doors closing, even whether it's a boxer or not a boxer, speaking or not speaking, his spirit never stopped growing. His spirit never stopped wanting to do two things, doing good for people and making a difference in the world. Somebody said of him, the mayor of Louisville, Kentucky said, Muhammad Ali was about spirituality, compassion, and kindness. And you look at the trajectory of his life, he was once hated. He was loved, hated, and so beloved, and one of the most famous people on the planet. To me, is that amazing? And someone said, so what do you think Ali would think of this? Well, he'd like it. But what he'd like even more is to ask yourself the question, is what are you going to do to make this world a better place? What are you going to do to be good to people around you? What are you going to do that is yours to do? I really believe that us being the best we can be is our responsibility to God, to humanity, and to the world. So who is the best that you are being called to be? and are willing to walk through that door and take the action and just do it. Because I guarantee you, it will lift you to a higher level than you can imagine. There are opportunities available to all of us. There are possibilities for all of us. The question is, are you willing to open and walk through that door? God bless you all.